Hey everyone, this is Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton. I was invited by an anti-war group in the United States called Massachusetts Peace Action to give a talk on U.S. imperialism in Latin America. I decided to turn that talk into an episode. I spoke for about two hours and I took some questions from the audience and we discussed a huge variety of issues involving Latin America and the bipartisan U.S. imperialism, the bipartisan policies that we see regardless of who's in the White House. So I talked about how similar Biden's foreign policy has been to Donald Trump's, and I talked about a variety of countries, including Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Ecuador. Uh, I also talked about Peru, Colombia, Chile. I mean, really an overview of the region and really looking at modern politics and the role of Washington and meddling in other countries' democracies. So without further ado, here is my talk. Thanks for listening or watching. Welcome everyone uh, to tonight's event uh, about Latin America and uh, Joe Biden and US imperialism. Uh, we're really honored tonight to be joined by uh, Ben Norton. Ben is a journalist with The Gray Zone. Uh, ben is a writer and a filmmaker. Uh, as you might've heard, he's uh, calling in live from Nicaragua. Uh, so he has a lot of experience in the region. He's lived there for a while, and we're really fortunate to be joined by Ben. So Ben, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right, Ben, to get us started, uh, just today, a few of our members in our Latin America working group, they were uh, circulating an article you wrote, uh, I think it's titled Biden's Plan for Central America. Uh, could you talk to us about that article? Absolutely. So, and as many people have probably seen, unfortunately, there's been almost entire continuity with the Biden administration when it comes to the Trump administration's Latin America policy, and, and really its foreign policy in general. We've seen that Antony Blinken has continued off exactly where, where Pompeo ended, and we saw, for instance, that Blinken has reaffirmed support for Juan Guaido as the supposed president of Venezuela, which at this point is almost comical. I mean, I can talk more about that later, but just in brief, Guaido, who of course was never elected to be president ever, he's, he's never won a single vote as president. He was only originally elected to be part of the National Assembly, but he's no longer even in the National Assembly. So it's, it's a farce that the U.S. still recognizes him as interim president, given that its own ridiculous excuse that it had used is no longer even relevant. But anyway, we've seen that the Biden administration is continuing to recognize Juan Guaido. The Biden administration is continuing to impose very suffocating sanctions on Venezuela and has said that it might reconsider them, but has not changed them in any way. And I should say that experts at the Center for Economic and Policy Research, which is one of the only good think tanks in D.C., they have estimated that at least 40,000 Venezuelan civilians have died because of those sanctions. And that's likely a very conservative estimate. A former U.N. special rapporteur um, Manuel, uh, who oversaw sanctions policy, top expert on sanctions for the United Nations, Alfred de Zayas, has said that it might be around 100,000 Venezuelan civilians who have died because of the sanctions. So those, those policies are continuing under the Biden administration. The Biden head of, or rather the spokesperson for the Biden State Department, who is Ned Price, a former CIA agent, who is now over helping to see oversee State Department policy, Ned Price has demonized the Sandinista government here in Nicaragua as being on the path to dictatorship, and I can talk more about that. So more continu continuity there between the Biden and Trump administrations. On Colombia, of course, the Biden administration is continuing to strongly support the extremely right-wing, very violent government there of Ivan Duque. And I should mention that Biden himself has taken credit for Plan Colombia, which I can speak more about in a bit. The U.S. has flooded Colombia with billions of dollars in funding for this program, which has only fueled extreme violence in the country, leading to thousands of deaths. In fact, the Colombian government, they created a special court to investigate uh, 
the violence in, in the kind of low low scale internal civil war that's been going on there for years. And the special court recently determined that 6,402 people have been, in, in a conservative estimate, have been massacred, have been murdered by the Colombian military and then falsely cl claimed, the Colombian military then falsely claimed that those people they killed were socialist guerrillas from the FARC or the ELN. So th this is a Colombian special court acknowledging that the the military, backed by the United States, with billions of dollars of funding through Plan Colombia, has massacred thousands of innocent civilians and falsely claimed that they're socialist guerrillas. So the, the Biden administration is continuing that policy. And then that brings us to Plan Biden. I mentioned Plan Colombia and the fact that Biden has taken credit for Plan Colombia, which was first started under President Bill Clinton. It, it, I mean, it's a bipartisan policy that has continued under Republicans, but it was very much a Democratic policy with a capital D Democratic. And Plan Biden is based on Plan Colombia. It, in fact, in English, the Biden administration has referred to it as the Biden plan for Central America. And in Spanish, that would be Plan Biden. So what is the Biden plan? Well, when Biden was campaigning to run for president, he almost never talked about foreign policy. If we can remember back to the Democratic primary, it was focused almost entirely on domestic policy. And of course, um, among the over one dozen candidates, Biden was probably the most right wing or one of the most right wing candidates. And when it came to foreign policy, one of the very few concrete proposals that Biden had was the Biden plan for Central America. You can find it on his campaign website. It actually goes quite into depth explaining what the policy is. In short, the Biden plan is the application of the same strategy used in Plan Colombia to Central America. The Biden administration looks at Central America and sees that this is a very impoverished region and it has been responsible for a majority of Latin immigration to the United States. So of the Latinos who come to the United States, it's the, the plurality are no longer Mexicans, actually. The plurality are actually Central Americans from the, the there's a triangle they refer to, the Northern Triangle nations. So depending on your definition of Central America, there are six or seven countries. And the Northern Triangle, the, the Northern half includes Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Those are the countries that are the least stable in the region and have the most immigrants and refugees. I would say that many of them are actually refugees, not immigrants. They're fleeing violence. They're fleeing organized crime. They're, fe they're economic refugees, and they're fleeing unemployment and poverty. And, of course, I'll talk about the situation in Honduras, which is responsible for the plurality of those Central American immigrants fleeing to the United States. And they are fleeing, in particular, a, an extremely corrupt right-wing narco regime led by a really a dictator who stole the last election, even the Organization of American States, which is an extremely biased body, which helped oversee a military coup in Bolivia. But even the Organization of American States has acknowledged that the so-called president of Honduras, Juan Orlando Hernandez, known by his initials HO, J-O-H, or pronounced HO, in Spanish, he stole the election. And he not only stole the election, but he used drug money to buy votes, to buy the election. And his brother, Tony Hernandez, is currently in prison in the United States for, and was, was sentenced, convicted by a federal court in New York for trafficking thousands of kilograms of cocaine into the United States, along with machine guns and other um, illegal activity. So the, the Northern Triangle countries are responsible for the plurality of Latin immigration to the United States. The Biden administration sees this situation and has decided that one of the way, one of their priorities is trying to stop that massive influx of immigration, of refugees. Now, of course, we, we should encourage any policy that would stop deplace, displacing these people from their countries. I mean, uh, we should support refugees and immigrants, of course, at, in the United States, but also, sure, I mean, the idea of trying to help strengthen uh, 
countries and economies in Central America is a good idea. Of course, we don't want so many people fleeing their home and they themselves don't want to flee their home. The idea that thousands and thousands of people just want to take this very dangerous trek up north because they believe that the American dream is so great and the U.S. is such a great country. Of course, we know that's, that's not what's actually happening. It's deeply exaggerated. The reality is that most of these people are refugees. Under international law, they could be considered refugees. But of course, the U.S. asylum laws are so strict, not just under Trump, but they're still strict. They were under Obama, and they are once again strict under Biden, and it makes it very difficult. I mean, it, honestly, it's very hard to get a visa, yet alone apply for asylum or refugee status. I mean, I know a lot of friends here in Nicaragua. It's, it's a little different in Nicaragua, but still, if you're a single woman, it's basically impossible. You cannot get a visa, even if you apply legally. And if you're a single man, it's very difficult. So it, the, the reality is that these people are fleeing very desperate conditions. So the idea of trying to stabilize Central America is a good one, but we have to look at the devils in the details. We have to look at the details of Plan Biden. What are the details? The Biden administration says that it's offering $4 billion in investment in Central America. Now, can, compared to the U.S. wars in Iraq, which is still ongoing, the war in Afghanistan, which is entering its 20th year and still ongoing, the war in Syria, which is ongoing, compared to the war in Yemen and the other wars that the U.S. is waging, the military wars, the U.S. spends billions of dollars every day. So $4 billion is not that much money. But to be fair, for the context of Central America, these are very poor countries. Central America is one of the poorest regions of the world. $4 billion is a significant estimate. It's a significant sum. But we have to look again at the details, the devils in the details. And the Biden administration is not giving that money for free. The Biden administration is basing this policy on a policy that began under Obama, that Biden himself oversaw, and that was called the Alliance for Prosperity. The Alliance for Prosperity was an attempt, because there was this Central, Central American immigration crisis, the Obama-Biden administration, as it's now referred to, had a policy of sending hundreds of millions of dollars per year into Central America, ostensibly to stabilize the Northern Triangle countries and to stop immigration. Well, we see the results of that, it clearly worked so well because the immigration has continued and only grown. I mean, I'm being sarcastic, obviously. So it didn't work, but the Biden plan is a continuation of that policy. And when you look at what he's actually calling for, it's more neoliberal structural adjustment programs. So it's more cutting programs that would help workers. It's more support for so-called free trade agreements like CAFTA. In fact, Central America is already part of a, an important free trade agreement with the United States called CAFTA. And that was part of one of, was one of the reasons that fueled progressive movements in the region, specifically here in Nicaragua with the Sandinista government and in, in Honduras, where there was a progressive president, Manuel Zelaya, who was overthrown in a coup in Honduras in 2009. So it's more continuation of these neoliberal policies. And when, when they call it the Biden plan, the fact that it's based on Plan Colombia is very significant because Plan Colombia has not stabilized Colombia. Colombia is even more violent now than it was in the 1990s when Bill Clinton began Plan Colombia. So really quickly, I know I'm, I'm kind of going at really in detail about this, but I think it's an important plan because as I point out in my, art, in my article at The Gray Zone, the Biden plan has been praised by right-wing leaders in Central America. That's what my article's about. Specifically, the former right-wing former president of, of Costa Rica and the former vice, the current, actually the former vice president and current OAS representative from Panama uh, also has praised it. Other right-wing officials from Guatemala, El Salvador. So the right-wing in Central America is saying very openly that they support this policy. So we should ask that if the right wing is saying they support it, why are people in the US, why are Democrats pretending that it's anything other than our right wing policy? Really quickly, just, just not to you know, beat this horse dead, but just I wanna read a few quotes from Plan Biden, because again, you can go to his official campaign website. 
and they go into detail about what their policy proposals are for Plan Biden. And let's keep in mind that this is, I think, just going to give us an idea of the tone in general of U.S. policy toward Latin America. This is not just for Central America. Okay, so these are the, the priorities and the strategies of Plan Biden. Quote, maximizing our trade and commercial deals also generates greater economic opportunities for U.S. businesses and investors through private sector investment, including through public-private partnerships to supplement government funds. So every time you hear that term, public-private partnership, your eyebrows should go up. I mean, that's exactly what the U.S. has been doing for so many years. In fact, the COVID vaccine policy was a public-private partnership. If you remember when Trump gave his speech announcing, I believe they call it Operation Warp Speed, where the, if, you, if you remember Trump's speech announcing that, he said the, the phrase public-private partnership two dozen times. He just kept saying it, kept saying it. It's part of that neoliberal newspeak. What they mean is giving government money, public money paid by tax dollars to private corporations who pocket the profit. That's exactly, I mean, that's, and that's what the U.S. vaccine program has been, by the way, whereas it was developed in China and Russia and Cuba and even India, which has a very right-wing government. But in those other countries, the government helped fund the creation of the vaccine and it has public involvement. And it's not just all going to profit the people like the Sacklers, like these oligarch capitalists who are responsible for so much misery in the United States and, and around the world. But anyway, so here are a few other uh, policy objectives of Plan Biden. They say that, that the administration will, quote, harness private sector investment to promote economic stability and job creation in Central America, end quote, by, quote, reducing the barriers to private sector investment, end quote, and, quote, improving the competitiveness of the Northern Triangle market. <laughs> now, I hope it's not just me. When I hear language like that, I immediately think of bankers. I mean, like, what is this? Like, this is supposed to be a progressive democratic administration? No, this is, this is neoliberal propaganda. I mean, when they say they want to reduce the barriers to private sector investment, they mean end any potential policies in Central America that would have protectionist trade measures, any tariffs or anything like that. I mean, there's very few of those policies in place anyway because of the neoliberal trade agreement, trade, uh, trade agreement CAFTA, because these governments are mostly right wing. When they say improving the competitiveness of the Northern Triangle market, of course, that's pretty clear what they mean by that. They also mean cutting workers' protections, improving the competitiveness by dropping wages. So, I mean, I could go on, on for this for a long time, but essentially, I think this, the reason I looked at this in this article and spent so much time reporting on it is that I think it, it really establishes the tone of the Biden administration. There's one other important detail about this. In this plan, it highly emphasizes mic microfinance programs. And I think anyone who, who has ever heard about microfinance programs and even knows a little bit should be really concerned when they hear that. This used to be really popular in like the 90s and early 2000s among these kind of liberal internationalist types who talked about how we can help empower people with micro loans and microfinance. The reality of that, if you look at India, which is a classic example, a case study of this, the, re the result has been tens of thousands of farmer suicides, a mass epidemic of death in India because there are so many poor people, largely farmers, who are trapped in unpayable debt because they take these micro loans, but they're still loans. I mean, in the US, we have a microfinance program too. It's called the pay, pay what is it, pay, pay day loans? That, that's microfinance, but they're just doing it on an international stage, so they call it micro loans, microfinance. It sounds so nice. I mean, so that's another part of this program. And then finally, NGOs and so-called civil society organizations are part of this. And I mentioned in my article that a former Obama administration official who is now in, involved in helping craft Latin America policy, he stressed that civil society is going to play a major role. In fact, here's the quote. He said that for the Biden administration, civil society organizations, so-called NGOs, are, quote, 
the favored interlocutors in the view of the administration in developing and implementing its policies in the region. So there you go. I mean, it's a continuation of the same kind of bipartisan neoliberal policies we've seen that have devastated Latin America, that have devastated Central America, that devastated Mexico when they had decades of neoliberal governments until recently, and we saw the massive immigration crisis after NAFTA, which again, CAFTA and NAFTA are modeled after each other. These are neoliberal trade agreements. NAFTA helped destroy local economies in Mexico, especially the agriculture sector, because you had poor workers in Mexico who were not able to compete with huge ag big ag agro-business corporations because those corporations, if you know about economies of scale, they, they operate at such a large scale and have so much product that they can afford, in the short term at least, they can afford losing money in the short term and selling their products for extremely low, uh, low prices so they can destroy all their competition. Who, in this case, they would be the local farmers, indigenous campesinos and, and others in Mexico. And then when they destroy all their competitors and displace them off their land and they take over their land, then they can later on raise the prices because they destroyed all their competitors. So this for me is the embodiment of the Biden administration's policy. As I you know, this answer was really long and I'm ranting, but as I began this answer explaining, the Biden administration has only continued the Trump administration's policy on Venezuela, on Nicaragua, on Colombia. And if you look at what its new policy proposals are for the region, they certainly don't inspire any confidence. Great, thank you for that, Ben. Um, yeah, no, that, that, that was a great answer. Uh, just a few points here. One, uh, the article that you were describing that you wrote, Brian shared. Brian Garvey shared that in the chat. So if people want to click on the link and save it for later, uh, they can do that. Just scroll up in the chat. Uh, they'll they'll see Brian sharing a link from the gray zone. Brian also shared another link, an action link, where people could click on it and send a message to their member of Congress, uh, basically encouraging members of Congress for to have the U.S. be a better neighbor to our neighbors in Central America and Latin America to end the sanctions and uh, some of these imperial policies been described. All right, uh, just a couple quick points here. I should have mentioned this in the beginning. Uh, this program is sponsored by Massachusetts Peace Action. If uh, this is your first time with Massachusetts Peace Action, we're a grassroots uh, anti-war group uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, we believe in things such as ending the sanctions on Venezuela, uh, ending U.S. imperialism in Latin America and throughout the world. Uh, so that's exactly why uh, we loved having Ben here. Um, all right, so there's that. Uh, ben, to follow up on your comments about the Biden plan, um, you know, I think the way you write about it and the way you talk about it uh, describes really well U.S. imperialism uh, right now in 2021 through a Democratic uh, Joe Biden administration. Uh, I think uh, that uh, in the aftermath of the Trump presidency, there's a lot of liberals and Democrats and center left people and left wing people who feel like traumatized by the Trump presidency. And uh, they, they might feel like you and people like you are being too harsh on Joe Biden and are, aren't you essentially apologizing for Trump? You're, are you a secret Trump supporter? Like what are, what are your, uh, what would your response be to, to people who, uh, people like that? I mean, it's so unfortunate. It's, it's honestly tragic that people have that kind of black and white worldview when it comes to US partisan politics, because the reality is that not, not in any way to, to, to be arrogant or to boast, but at the gray zone, we were some of the most harsh critics, some of the harshest critics of Trump's foreign policy in particular. And we, of course, focus mostly on foreign policy. Of course, if you look at domestic policy, it's certainly true that Biden has some better policies, some, although he's continued a lot of horrible policies. We still don't have $2,000 checks. The Democratic Party, I mean, it's not entirely Biden's fault, but the Democratic Party just killed the possibility for a $15 minimum wage. You can go down the list. But when you look at foreign policy, the, the reality, it's just, it just an undeniable fact. Bipartisan imperialism is the dominant foreign policy for both Republicans and Democrats. But at the gray zone, I mean, we spent the last four years, more than that, constantly criticizing and exposing Trump's 
horrible foreign policy on so many issues. I mean, his continued military occupation of Northeast Syria, where he openly boasted that he was keeping troops there to steal the oil. He didn't even hide it. And when he says steal the oil, it's not just steal the oil for profiting Western corporations, which it is, but it's also st stealing the oil so they can starve the Syrian government of money it needs to reconstruct the country. So they're preventing Syria from rebuilding so people can't rebuild their houses. They can't rebuild their cities that have been destroyed by a decade of war. We, ex we harshly criticized and exposed the horrible consequences of Trump's sanctions on Syria, which by the way, never get mentioned in mainstream media, even unfortunately in progressive media. There's so little coverage of the medieval murderous sanctions that the US and the European Union have on Syria that have resulted like the sanctions on Iran, like the sanctions on Venezuela, in a massive humanitarian and economic crisis right now. In Syria, there's a massive bread shortage, food shortage caused by the sanctions and the economic crisis, also because the US military occupation of Northeast Syria is not only in the oil and hydrocarbons rich area, but also in the breadbasket region that produces much of the wheat used to create bread in Syria. So we, we have been exposing the horrible consequences of those sanctions, and they almost never get mentioned, even by some of Trump's most fervent critics who think that he's like Hitler reincarnate. And then we, on Venezuela, I mean, we were some of the only journalists every single week publishing, I, I, we actually published over 100 reports on Venezuela under the Trump administration. Of course, all of them criticizing the Trump administration for its policies in Venezuela, for trying to overthrow the government, the elected government, trying to violently overthrow the government multiple times and also imposing medieval sanctions, a total economic blockade that's even worse than the blockade of Cuba, which has gone on over 60 years now. So, I mean, or our extremely harsh coverage criticizing Trump for and exposing Trump for killing Qasem Soleimani, one of the top Iranian officials, not just a top Iranian general, but one of the top officials in the Iranian government. There's not really anyone to compare him to. It, it's like, he's, he's not like the president, but he's like basically second to the president, or he was rather. And we reported a lot on that. And we, we actually helped expose, for instance, which was curiously not mentioned in mainstream corporate media, because many of them actually praised Trump for killing Qasem Soleimani. Because every time Trump bombs Syria or bombs Iran or imposes sanctions, every time Trump did something like that, he was actually praised by many of those liberal elements that, I mean, certainly not the progressive elements, but the kind of mainstream Democratic Party forces praised him. And anyway, the point is we actually help expose how under Trump, when he killed Qasem Soleimani, Qasem Soleimani was in Iraq for a peace talk. He was having peace talks with Iraq. And that's when the US executed him in a crime against, I mean, a war crime. It's absolutely against international law. The US is not legally at war with Iran. You can't just execute foreign government officials like that. I mean, the US empire thinks it can, and it's tried and it has done so dozens of times. Patrice Lumumba was killed with CIA involvement, the democratically elected prime minister of Congo. There was over 638 assassination attempts against Fidel Castro. I mean, you can go down the list of so many. I mean, they, they executed Muammar Gaddafi, the president of Libya. So, you know, you can get on the list. But the point, the idea that we're, so we support Trump or we supported Trump is so absurd. The reality is that if you challenge the kind of mainstream centrist Demo Democratic Party consensus, then that you're often smeared as that. I mean, but it's so cynical. And if you, specifically, if you opposed the Russiagate conspiracy, which, I mean, we don't have time to get into, but the idea that Trump, this far-right demagogue who appealed to racism and xenophobia and all of this, these horrible things, that he was just a product of Russia, as if the U.S. isn't a country founded on genocide and settler colonialism against indigenous peoples, where over 100 million indigenous peoples were killed through the process of colonization of the modern-day United States, or chattel slavery, racist chattel slavery against people of African descent. I mean, unfortunately, the reality is Trump is an awful racist bigot. And in many ways, he actually represents American history and the awful racism and bigotry and right-wing politics at the heart of American history. And, and 
a lot of people, unfortunately, who, who might have more progressive inclinations or, you know, liberal dem Democrats, they, they just can't, they don't want to grapple with that reality, or at least until last year with the, the massive uprising against police brutality, when people saw the extreme racism and violence of the American state. But again, when it comes to foreign policy, unfortunately, realistically, there are very few differences between Democratic and Republican administrations. And this goes back decades. This is not a new phenomenon. This is not something unique to Biden. Let's be real. The Obama administration oversaw the disastrous war that destroyed Libya as a state. This March is the 10 year anniversary of the NATO military intervention that destroyed Libya. Libya still does not have a central government, still today. And the reality of that, the, re the result of that war was not only destroying the country, which had been the most prosperous country in Africa, regardless of what you think about the government, which certainly wasn't a democratic government, but people had healthcare, they had education, they had housing that was subsidized heavily. Even cars were subsidized heavily. And it had very substantial oil reserves, which were plundered by, plundered by British and French companies. And after that, the so-called rebels backed by NATO ethnically cleansed black Africans, dark-skinned Libyans and sub-Saharan African refugees. Even Human Rights Watch acknowledged, they did a report acknowledging the massive ethnic cleansing by these Salafi jihadist extremist so-called moderate rebels backed by NATO and Libya. This is all under the Obama administration and Hillary Clinton's State Department. Hillary Clinton helped take the lead in this war. I mean, I can go down, I mean, I, we don't have time to get into this. Then there's, of course, the war in Syria. Then there's the, the military coup in Honduras in 2009 that also led to the assassination of one of the most famous feminist environmentalist activists, Berta Cáceres, in the entire world, who was Honduran and she was executed. And at the Gray Zone, we visited her hometown and interviewed her mother. And that was under the Obama administration and the Hillary Clinton State Department. I mean, you can go on the list, there are so many examples. So unfortunately, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying this in any way to absolve Trump, but the reality is that there's much more continuity than change. By the way, when I say there is much more continuity than change, that's a very specific quote from a former CIA director who said that during the Trump administration. He said, quote, it is more continuity than change. He was talking about foreign policy, of course. So, and, and there are countless examples of that. So when we look at the Biden administration's policy right now, I mean, if, if we're accused of being crypto Trump supporters, which is outrageous, then I guess the people who, who support Biden's Venezuela policy are also Trump supporters. I guess Biden is a Trump supporter because he's continuing Biden's, he's continuing Trump's Venezuela policy. Now that policy began with Obama. It was Obama who in 2015, signed an executive or order declaring Venezuela to be an, a, an extraordinary and unusual threat to the national security of the United States. That was the Obama administration. And every year since then, in fact, last week, the Biden administration renewed that executive order declaring Venezuela to be a threat to US national security. Come on, are, are we supposed to believe that Nicolas Maduro is gonna like do another 9-11 or something? What are you talking about? I mean, it's especially, it's especially outrageous when you consider that right now, the United States and Saudi Arabia are supporting Al-Qaeda in Yemen. That was acknowledged even by the Wall Street Journal. That was acknowledged even by the Associated Press. In fact, not only ha have they been supporting Al-Qaeda, but the US gave weapons to Saudi Arabia, which it promptly gave to Al-Qaeda in Yemen. So, I mean, we're supposed to believe that Venezuela, according to Obama, Trump, and Biden, who have all signed executive orders claiming that Venezuela is a national security threat, we're supposed to believe that Nicolas Maduro is basically, what, does he have WMDs now we're supposed to believe? And let's be real, Biden, of course, was one of the lead cheerleaders for the war in Iraq as a Democrat. Not only did he support it, he gave speeches praising George Bush, George Bush Jr. I mean, you can find this, it's on C-SPAN, praising George Bush, saying he's a great man, and that he supports the war efforts, and Biden whipped Democratic votes in support of the, the war in Iraq. So we have to be realistic about what we're dealing with here, because if we do want to end the wars, if we do want to end the sanctions, which are another form of war, if we do want to end 
these bipartisan policies that have led to tens of millions of dollars of deaths, uh, tens of millions of deaths. And, and, and I'm not exaggerating. We're talking about since World War II, U.S. foreign policy has been responsible for tens of millions of deaths. Just in Vietnam, over 3 million Vietnamese were killed. Just in the Korean War, around 2 or 3 million, 2 or 3 million Koreans were killed. 80% of cities, rather, were razed to the ground. 20% of the population of North Korea was killed in the Korean War, a totally bipartisan war. And the Vietnam War, a totally bipartisan war. And, this, and then there's another nearly 1 million in Cambodia, in Laos. I mean, we're talking about, those are just the wars in Southeast Asia. We're not talking about the 500,000 children in Iraq who died because of UN sanctions that were led by the Clinton administration in the 1990s. And of course, that I should remind people that the Secretary of State at the time of Bill Clinton, Madeleine Albright, gave an interview in 60 Minutes in which he was asked if the price was worth it, that is, the price of 500,000 Iraqi children dying from the sanctions, and she said, it's a difficult question, but yes, we think the price is worth it. You can find that video on YouTube. So we're talking about tens of millions of deaths, uh, at least another million killed in, in the second Iraq war, not, not, not even to mention the first Iraq war, the Gulf War in 1990, 1991, in which the U.S. bombs Iraqi soldiers fleeing, fleeing on the highway of death, and in which the U.S. intentionally targeted Iraqi civilian infrastructure, destroying hospitals, destroying bridges. We're talking about tens of millions of deaths since the end of World War II caused by U.S. wars and U.S. sanctions and other policies. So if we want to end that massive human suffering that massive bloodletting, these massacres, this, this torture of so many people around the world. One quarter of the planet right now, in terms of population, lives in countries under U.S. sanctions. One quarter of the planet. We, we can't just blame the Republicans. It's too easy, and it lets off people who are just as complicit. If we're serious about finding solutions to these problems, we have to deal with the very real problem in the United States that imperialism, that these policies I'm describing, are completely bipartisan. And unfortunately, the last comment I'll say here is that under the Trump administration, we saw Democratic support for many of these policies increase. Unfortunately, that's, I don't say that with any hope, I don't say that with any chagrin, or I, say, I say, do say that with chagrin, rather. I don't say it because I'm glad about that. I say it because the reality is that the CIA rebranded under the Trump administration, John Brennan is a regular still on MSNBC. They portray themselves as part of the resistance against Trump. The FBI was portrayed as part of the resistance against Trump. This, this agency that was responsible in killing black liberation leaders during COINTELPRO, like Fred Hampton, but now they're part of the progressive resistance against Trumpism. And we saw many people, unfortunately, especially Democratic Party leaders, embrace more hawkish policies and war, even neoconservative forces like Bill Kristol. Bill Kristol was an architect of the Iraq war. A neoconservative war hawk was invited on MSNBC and they said that he is now woke Bill Kristol. They said that he's now progressive because he opposes Trump. We have to oppose Trump, but we also have to oppose the war makers in the Democratic Party and especially if they're trying to rebrand war and empire as something progressive, because it's not, it's the opposite. Right. Uh, so basically you're a Trump supporter. We get it. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, but as you mentioned, like uh, when, when Trump was bombing Syria and Brian Williams was talking about, oh, now Trump is presidential. And uh, also when we brought on Aaron Matei to talk about Russiagate, uh, you know, one of the consequences of Russiagate was, uh, you know, the rehabilitation of the neocons because now they're opposing Trump and uh, woke Bill Crystal, as you mentioned. All right. So moving right along, um, I actually missed this announcement, but uh, uh, some of our Ma Mass Peace Action Latin America Working Group members today, they were uh, telling me and others about uh, recently there was an announcement about uh, this TPS program, Temporary Protected Status for Immigrants. 
uh, about them expanding it to uh, something like 300,000 uh, Venezuelan people uh, in the country. So our question was basically, uh, you know, what should we make about this announcement? How should we understand this? What does this mean? Do, do you know about this? Yeah, absolutely. Well, of course, I absolutely support immigrants and we should support immigrants' rights anywhere. And and everyone who lives in the United States deserves res legal residency status. I mean, I absolutely support that, that there are over 10 million people in the United States living in a kind of legal limbo, and that not only leads to the deprivation of their human rights and basic political rights, because they can't participate in the, in the political system, but also leads to massive economic exploitation. And especially if you look at the southern border, I mean, the, expo the economic exploitation, the super exploitation of undocumented immigrants is absolutely outrageous. I mean, we're talking about slave-like conditions in farms, we're talking about in meat packing plants in particular with COVID. I mean, it's, they've been become like factories of death. I mean, they already are factories of death with, I mean, they're slaughterhouses, but a lot of that work is done by immigrant labor and now they're, they're sacrificing their, their health. So we should support immigrants, but we should also understand that not every immigrant in the United States comes from the same background, right? That there are major class differences and that the reality of Venezuelan immigrants in the United States is that many of them, certainly not all, but many of them are, are pretty well to do because they had enough money to fly to the United States. Many of them are in the United States legally and they had the, the means to leave the country and come to the United States. Similarly, there are many Cubans who, who fled before, during and after the Cuban revolution to Florida and are now one of the main bases of the right wing in, in Florida. No, no one in the right mind would say that Cuban immigrants, many of almost all of whom were extremely rich, who fled before, after, and during, before, during, and after the revolution are the same thing as poor Central American refugees fleeing violence and persecution. So the reality is that many Venezuelans in the United States have a different class background. They're more privileged and have more money that, that's not to say all of them, and, and I mean, it's, it's good that, again, that they're going to have legal status regardless of, of their class background, but some people on the, on the progressive side are trying to use this as an example of Biden supporting immigrants. I mean, again, on average, these immigrants are some of the most privileged. We're not talking about Honduran and El Salvadorian immigrants fleeing violence. We're not talking about Mexican immigrants who are fleeing because they're or they're economic immigrants because their jobs were destroyed because of NAFTA and these neoliberal policies. So the reality is that what's happening is that there's a new base of support for extremely hawkish policies against Venezuela, just as there was with the Cuban lobby in, I mean, it still exists, in Florida, which gave, which brought us great beneficent politicians like Marco Rubio. I mean, one of the most horrible neoconservative Republicans. And now there is a growing basis of hardline right-wing Venezuelans in the United States. Again, that's not to say that all of the people getting TPS are that. I mean, there are Venezuelans who are working class, who are poor, and who fled because the economic situation in Venezuela is very real. And I'll talk about that now. The, the, the economic difficulties are very real. The situation in Venezuela economically is very difficult. I mean, I've been there several times. I, sp I spent half the year there in 2019 when the, the U.S., when the, the, the peak of the U.S. coup attempt with Juan Guaido and all that. And inflation is very bad. And inflation has destroyed the savings of pretty much anyone who wasn't part of that like 10, 15% elite who had all their wealth in dollars. Now, we should also keep in mind that in Venezuela, going back many decades, ever since oil was discovered 100 years ago in Venezuela, there has been this elite class in Venezuela who would regularly go to Florida and other parts of the United States and Europe with ease. They have a lot of money. The wealthy oligarchs in Venezuela are up there on the par, par with, not like the billionaire oligarchs, but like with with rich people in the United States. In, in some parts of the, of the global south, uh, 
there are rich people, but they're not nearly as rich as rich people in the United States. No, the Venezuelan oligarchy is one of the most vicious, extreme right-wing oligarchies in Latin America because they have the most to lose, because they have been so privileged and had so much wealth built on that oil wealth for almost 100 years, for 80 years or so, Venezuela's oil wealth went to benefit the oligarchs and a few, a small percentage of it went to benefit social programs. Hugo Chavez, the democratically elected socialist president of Venezuela who won the fir his first election in 1998, when he came in in 1999, he revolutionized Venezuelan politics in a way we had never seen before with this radical notion that we should use our natural resources to benefit our people. I know, crazy, right? because we're so used to natural resources going to benefit ExxonMobil and foreign corporations. But he said, we want to give, use that wealth and give that to poor and working class people to develop our country, to fund housing. More than 3 million housing units have been built since the beginning of the housing program in, in a decade under the Bolivarian revolution in, in Venezuela. And I've seen them. It's actually pretty high quality housing. I mean, I lived in much worse apartments in New York, in Brooklyn, than, than the housing they're building in Venezuela for either free or for very cheap for people. And then of course they invested in education, they invested in social programs, they invested in helping peasants and, and helping develop other infrastructure, although unfortunately the reality is in Venezuela pretty much everything is based on oil production, which is why the US blockade has been so devastating. And that's why it's really, it's kind of destroyed the economy. I mean, someone in this chat posted a, a very important uh, document. It's the interim report that was published by the current UN Special Rapporteur on how sanctions affect human rights. And her name is Elena Duhan. She's a human rights professor from Belarus. And my colleague at the Gray Zone, Anya Parmpol, interviewed her, if you want to check out the interview. And in this preliminary report, she, well, she took a trip to Venezuela for two weeks. And in this prelim preliminary report, she explains how due to the U.S. sanctions and economic blockade and also the European Union sanctions on Venezuela, the country has lost 99% of its revenue. And that is because it's a petro state. And it has been a petro state for 100 years. It's a problem that predated Chavismo. Anyway, I mean, I can and maybe we, I will talk more about Venezuela on this, maybe if you want me to talk more because there's a lot to say. But... The reality is that Venezuela is suffering through an economic crisis, it's true, caused overwhelmingly by the US and the EU sanctions, not entirely to be fair. It's also because they made some mistakes and it's also because the price of oil plummeted in 2014, part of a US strategy at the time because the US was ex drastically expanding fracking and the US was also encouraging Saudi Arabia we now know to massively over pump oil through Saudi Aramco in order to drop the price of oil, which hurt the economies of Russia, Iran, and Venezuela. And that was part of a concerted strategy. But, you know, Venezuela has made, certainly made mistakes. And the reality is also, this is a country that has been extremely dependent on oil for a hundred years. So any sanctions are going to hurt it in a way that they're not hurting other countries as much. I mean, they're still hurting, for instance, Cuba. The blockade in Cuba has been horrible, but Cuba has no oil, and it doesn't rely on oil exports. Whereas Venezuela, the reason 99% of its revenue has disappeared is because almost the entire economy was based on oil exports. So we should keep in mind that because of the U.S. sanctions, that, that means that not only can Venezuela not do business with other countries, with other entities in the United States, it also means that basically almost no other country that's an ally of the United States is going to allow business with Venezuela because of something called secondary sanctions. This has to be stressed when we're talking about how, how sanctions are so destructive because the reality is that not only do the U.S. sanctions affect Venezuela, but they also affect other countries that might consider doing business with Venezuela. So Venezuela's state oil company, PDVSA, cannot sell oil to Korea, to Japan, to even U.S. allies because they 
are going to face secondary sanctions by the United States on themselves, on Korea, on Japan. The United States actually threatened their own allies with secondary sanctions. India had actually bought a lot of Venezuela from a lot of oil from Venezuela, and the U.S. threatened secondary sanctions on Venezuela. India also was one of the largest importers of oil from Iran specifically, and in India had to cut back on its oil imports from Iran because of U.S. secondary sanctions. So again, that, that was a long answer, but the reality is that we have to look at what's going on in Venezuela, realize that yes, there are people who have left who are economic immigrants, because the situation is very difficult, and they've gone to many other countries, specifically neighboring countries, and those people in neighboring countries like Colombia, I've seen them on the streets of Colombia, I've seen them on the streets of Ecuador, there are, there are large numbers of Venezuelan immigrants, and those are poor Venezuelan immigrants who are suffering. In Colombia, there's a huge problem with homeless Venezuelans who have no support whatsoever from the Colombian government, who are begging, Women are being forced to prost go into prostitution. Children are not being educated. It's a horrible human tragedy. And that is, they are, they are refugees of war. Just like Syrian refugees are refugees of the dirty war on their country, or Yemeni refugees, or Iraqi refugees. The, ve the, the Venezuelans who have left the country, it's probably between one and two million Venezuelans, they need to be considered refugees of war because the United States and the European Union have been waging a war on Venezuela. But again, the Venezuelans in the United States are not the same. And again, it's not to say that they're all right-wing and rich and there are working-class Venezuelan immigrants, but there's no border shared between Venezuela and the United States. It's pretty hard to get to the United States if you're in Venezuela, unless you have enough money to buy a plane ticket and get a visa, or you have family members there, and it's very expensive. I mean, people don't realize how the minimum wage in many Latin American countries is $200, $300, $400 a month. So the people, many of the Venezuelans in the United States are not the poor Venezuelans we see on the streets of Colombia and Ecuador. And by the way, the last thing I'll say in response to this, a, a little known fact that has not been stressed enough in the media is that, in fact, I've never seen it acknowledged in the U.S. media, and it's barely acknowledged in the Spanish language media, but Venezuela has a program called Vuelto a la Patria, which means return to the homeland, in which thousands of Venezuelans have actually returned back to Venezuela, especially during COVID, because, one, a lot of them were, I mean, they were, they, they were suffering. The situation is very difficult in Venezuela, economically, and... A lot of people, were, they believe this propaganda that in Colombia they'll have job opportunities and all these things, and then they get there and they realize that they're just as desperate, if not even more desperate, in Colombia than they were in Venezuela. And, and they're being tra trafficked, they're being robbed, they're being exploited. So a lot of them have gone back to Venezuela, and Venezuela has actually, the government has organized planes, free planes for Venezuelan immigrants in other countries, I've seen my own, I've seen this with my own eyes. When I was in Ecuador for the election this February, I, in Guayaquil, I went by the, in the morning, the Venezuelan consulate there, which is now, it was controlled by Juan Guaido's fake unelected coup regime. Now it's controlled by the real government of Venezuela again. And every morning, there are long lines, every morning in Guayaquil, Ecuador, there are long lines of Venezuelan immigrants waiting so they can try to go back to Venezuela through the Voto La Patria program. So it's a much more complicated situation, but that was a long answer, but hopefully I think that I can provide a little more nuance to understand what's going on. Yeah, definitely. And uh, that, that really helps us uh, better understand this TPS announcement because we were talking about it uh, earlier today. Uh, I see uh, Latin America Working Group co-chair John Ratcliffe has a question, so I'm going to call on him uh, to ask his question. John, can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I want to thank Ben. Um, we really appreciate your coverage, and uh, you've done a wonderful job reporting from Latin America, from your new home in Nicaragua and the rest of uh, Latin America. 
a few years ago, I think it was you know, about 10 years ago or so, there was such hope throughout the continent. There were a numerous countries that were striking out in various national projects to reclaim the wealth of their countries and develop in ways, not all the same, but with an emphasis on the development for the people in the various countries. It was sometimes called a pink tide. Um, and to me, it seems like behind some kind of a curtain, there was a very conscious effort to undo a lot of that progress um, that has taken place during the Trump administration over the last few years, maybe starting with the coup in, uh, in Honduras that you mentioned earlier. Um, but more recently, and with great hope, after they failed to overthrow Nicaragua and Venezuela in the last couple of years, there seems to have been a return to the process. We saw first Mexico, then Argentina, uh, using electoral methods, put forward progressive uh, governments. Uh, we saw the failed coup in Bolivia and the heroic struggle of the Bolivian people to force an election and then win that election in a commanding way. I know you just came back from Ecuador. I wonder if you could, and then most recent, I guess it was yesterday, uh, they were forced to free Lula from all of the sort of um, charges that were hanging over his head, at least temporarily to open the way for his return to politics. When do you see any hope for a new movement? Part of what they had been able to do is support each other once they were you know, these progressive projects were in place in the various countries. And some of that international infrastructure still exists. So I wondered if you could give us sort of your overview of what the hopes are for a possible return to a new pink tide or whatever uh, we want to call it. Absolutely. Great question and great comments. It's, it's a pretty hopeful moment right now, believe it or not. There are a lot of difficulties. I mentioned the difficulties in Venezuela. There are difficulties here in Nicaragua. The U.S. has sanctions here as well, although the Sandinistas learned after the U.S.-backed terror war and sanctions in the 1980s, and Nicaragua is now completely food sovereign, unlike Venezuela, unfortunately. In Venezuela, Chavez and Maduro and the, the Chavista process have tried to expand food production, but it's very difficult. And it's especially very difficult to convince young people to to leave the cities and, you know, their social media lives and go be farmers. I mean, it's a very it's easier said than done. So in Venice, in Nicaragua, you know, the sanctions haven't hurt as much, but there still are difficulties. You mentioned that there was a coup attempt in 2018. It was very violent here. And I can talk more about that, but it failed. And in Venezuela, we saw that the U.S. coup attempt failed there. The constant coup attempts in Cuba have failed for 60 years. And in Bolivia, the defeat of the U.S.-backed coup regime is absolutely historic. We cannot overstate the importance of what happened in Bolivia. I'll, I'll briefly summarize it. I actually, I went to Bolivia. I was there before, during, and after the election. And it was an incredible moment. This was in October of 2020. So really quickly, in October of 2019, there was an election and Evo Morales, the first and only ever indigenous leader to win the presidency in Bolivia, he was reelected free and, freely and fairly. And in Bolivia, like in Ecuador, there is a two round process for the presidential election. If you win the first round of the vote with more than 50% or if you have more than 40% of the vote and then you're 10% above the second place candidate, you win in the first round and there's no need to go to a runoff election. Evo Morales won with slightly over 10%, 10% and some change. The Organization of American States, backed by the United States government and the governments of Colombia and Brazil, which are extremely right-wing, backed this bogus, uh, 
claim that there was fraud, there, there was no evidence of it, it was a lie, based on the fact that the rural areas in Bolivia, which are strongholds of Evo Morales' movement, the movement towards socialism party, they're largely indigenous areas, those votes came in later in the night, so over throughout the night, as the rural, rural vote began being counted, the margin between Evo and the second place candidate, Carlos Mesa, a neoliberal candidate, that margin increased and increased and Evo won. So using those false claims of fraud that were later totally debunked, including by experts at MIT, including by experts at the Center for Economic and Policy Research, but given that uncertainty and the vague air of accusations of fraud, the military stepped in. We now know that the military was bribed. Military officers were bribed by Bolivian oligarchs, and the United States was involved, and specifically Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, and Bob Menendez were involved, being involved in, in this. They were named as being involved in this, this coup plot. And they worked with military leaders, including the head of the military, um, who's now allegedly living in the United States, and also police, they bribed them to call for Evo Morales to step down in what is really a coup. I mean, it's absolutely a military coup. It's not the textbook definition of a military coup, but the military telling a democratically elected leader to step down is a coup. And after the coup, the unelected regime that came in was extremely racist, extremely right-wing, and ex Christian fundamentalists, led by Janine Añez, who she had tweets in which she claimed that the indigenous people in Bolivia, who represent nearly two-thirds of the population, the majority, she claimed that they were satanic and said that they should leave the cities and go back to the countryside. Extremely racist. She also on the night of the coup, she entered the presidential palace with a giant Bible, like a comically large Bible, bigger than like any book I've ever seen. I mean, uh, overcompensating for something there. I mean, just like trying to show everyone how Christian she is when, when actually she's doing unchristian things like uh, killing, massacring indigenous people. And that's exactly what happened. Dozens of indigenous protest, largely indigenous, not only, but mostly indigenous protesters were massacred. At, uh, specifically, there were two large massacres. Um, one of them is called the Senkata, S-E-N-K-A-T-A. And we, we went, my colleagues and I, Max Blumenthal and Anya Parmpo, we went to Senkata, we interviewed family members of survivors, and we produced a, doc a short documentary film about the Senkata massacre, which you can find at the Gray Zone. Horrifying experience. I mean, that all of those families went through. And then what happened is that the coup regime delayed the election three times, three times, that we need to keep that in mind. And then after so many delays, the Bolivian people, and specifically the Movement Towards Socialism Party, which has a massive social movement, and there's a huge tr trade union federation with six massive unions, uh, Bolivia is one of the most highly unionized countries in the entire world. They all mobilized. They, they brought the country to a halt and made the country ungovernable for the unelected coup regime. So the reality is that the coup regime was forced to have the election last October because after delaying the election three times, there was no possibility of governing because the, the movement towards socialism party was so well organized. And they won the election in a landslide, a historic landslide by 20% over the neoliberal Carlos Mesa. Incredible, historic. I mean, a major victory for the people of Bolivia. And they're back. And they have rejoined these in important international blocs. Things like, uh, well, we should also understand that the United States as part of this process of undermining the pink tide, the progressive governments, the United States has tried to destroy regional institutions like the Union for South American Nations, UNASUR, and the Bolivarian Trade Alliance, ALBA. I'll, train with, I'll explain what those are in a second. Bolivia is now rejoining them under the movement towards socialism government. Bolivia is returning toward socialistic policies, progressive policies for its people. Massive victory.
and you mentioned Mexico and Argentina. Those victories are important. They're not at the same level, but they are important. One, it's extremely important in Mexico because Mexico for five decades was governed by nonstop neoliberal, neoliberal, neoliberal candidates. I mean, always neoliberals. And we saw that uh, Enrique Peña Nieto, the, the past president, was moving toward trying to privatize the oil industry in Mexico, which is, which is a huge taboo because nationalization of Mexico's substantial oil reserves was written into the revolutionary constitution in the, the decade of, of revolution from 1910 to 1920 in Mexico. So there were so many right-wing corrupt neoliberal leaders. The U.S. puppet Felipe Calderón, a close friend of George, George W. Bush, from the right-wing PAN party in Mexico, he had launched the horrific war on drugs that has led to hundreds of thousands of deaths. I mean, just a bloodbath that has devastated Mexico and corrupted the politics and hurt the country irreparably. And the fact that a progressive independent from a totally new party outside of the corrupt parties that dominated the bipartisan consensus, uh, AMLO, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador is his name, known by his initials AMLO. The fact that he won, he's not a socialist, he's a progressive, but the fact that he won is a massive victory for the Mexican people and for progressive forces in the region because Mexico is the southern neighbor of the United States. It is one of the most colonized country when it comes to the United States. It, it, it has sacrificed so much of its sovereignty, so much of its, rather, a lot of it wasn't voluntary, so much of its sovereignty was taken away from it, just being the southern neighbor with a massive border it shares with the United States. And the fact that AMLO is independent and he's progressive, again, he's not a radical, but he's an extremely welcome development. He opposed the U.S. coup attempt in Venezuela. He's the only Mexican president who hasn't just rolled over for the U.S. government. That's, that's not to say there's not criticisms of, of him. Of course there are, but you know he's, he's he's a very welcome development. In Argentina, they came back to a progressive government. It's not great, but it's center left. It's progressive. It's much better than the right wing neoliberal who had governed before, Mauricio Macri. Mauricio Macri was extremely corrupt and had entrapped Argentina with the largest IMF loan in history. And if you know anything about the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, for the entire history, since it was created at the Bretton Woods Conference after World War II, as a vehicle for U.S. imperial power around the world, the IMF imposes these neoliberal structural adjustment programs, which traps countries in austerity policies, in privatizing their social programs, and in cutting support for poor and working people. And with $56 billion dollars, in loans from the IMF, Argentina has been really suffering through another economic crisis, which of course doesn't get much coverage because unlike the economic crisis in Venezuela, which can be blamed on socialism, even though it was for the most part caused by US sanctions, the crisis in, Vene in Argentina can't be blamed on socialism because it was caused by a neoliberal right-wing candidate. So those are very welcome developments. And now we're seeing Ecuador the election in Ecuador is extremely important. I just got back from Ecuador. The U.S. is meddling blatantly. And it's so, I mean, it's honestly shocking how blatant it is. The Biden administration claims that it's going to be progressive and all of this. Well, the reality is that Biden's top Latin America advisor is an extremely negative influence, putting it mildly. His name is Juan Sebastián González, or as I sometimes call him, the bad Juan Gonzalez, as opposed to the, the good Juan Gonzalez of democracy now. Juan Sebastian Gonzalez is the, is the head of Western Hemispheric Affairs for the National Security Council for Biden. He's Biden's top Latin America policy advisor. And he is a right-wing Colombian who supports the right-wing Colombian government. He also was, he did peace work in Guatemala, which is very suspicious, and he has been helping to oversee a lot of this policy. And then the State Department under Anthony Blinken, who's also very hawkish, he 
has he supported the war in Iraq. He supported the war in Libya and helped oversee it. He supported the war in Syria and helped oversee it. He supported sending weapons to Yemen, to Saudi Arabia to wage war in Yemen. And on Latin America, Antony Blinken has continued, again, recognizing Juan Guaido and these very hawkish policies. Under the Biden State Department, they're currently helping the extremely corrupt authoritarian government in Ecuador try to rig the election, really to steal the electoral victory from the leading socialist candidate, Andres Arauz. Now in Ecuador, in 2007, they, uh, the Ecuadorian people elected their first left-wing leader in a while, Rafael Correa was his name, and he launched a progressive movement called the Citizens' Revolution. Correa was also part of, a, he self-identified as part of a movement called Socialism in the 21st Century, which was launched by Hugo Chavez, and these are the new waves of socialist government. So unlike say the progressive president of Mexico, AMLO, or the progressive president of Argentina, Alberto Fernandez, who are, they do not call themselves socialists. Correa in Ecuador called himself a socialist. And his follower, a former minister, and the current leading candidate in the election is a 36-year-old left-wing economist named Andres Arauz. And Arauz continues in the footsteps of Correa and his movement, also known as Correismo. And we've seen that he won the first round of the election on February 7th, Arauz did, in a landslide with 33% of the vote, which is 13% more than the second place candidate, Guillermo Lasso. Now, there were a lot of irregularities in that election. I saw them with my own eyes when I was there. There were long lines. It was very suspicious. The Electoral Council in Ecuador has been very biased and very politicized under the very authoritarian current government of Lenin Moreno, which is very right-wing, which is very corrupt. We know that the current president of Ecuador, Lenin Moreno, ha has stolen millions of dollars and hidden them in, of public money and hidden them in offshore bank accounts. This was released as part of a scandal called the INA Papers, I-N-A. They're called the INA Papers because I-N-A are the initials of his children, of Lenin Moreno's children. So extremely corrupt. And we've seen that, that the government now in Ecuador is trying to disqualify Andres Arauz, who won the socialist who won in the landslide in the first round, and trying to prevent him from participating on the, in the runoff, the second round of the presidential election on April 11th, by accusing him outrageously of taking money from the Colombian Socialist Guerrilla Army, the ELN, the National Liberation Army. And this is totally false, and it's comically false. So what happened is that these three guys published a video on social media claiming to be ELN guerrillas, wearing guerrilla clothes, and they have a big ELN flag behind them, and they're in a forest. And at the bottom of the video, it says a forest in Colombia, which is the first sign that like, uh, what, why would they put a forest in Colombia? If they really are ELN people, they don't need to convince us of that. We know they're in Colombia. Of course, they're not actually ELN people, which is why they put that at the bottom. There were typos in the video. They were holding hunting rifles, not assault rifles. And the cherry on top, the reason we know that they're not really Colombian guerrillas is one, they don't even have Colombian accents. It's obvious, even to me, I'm not a native Spanish speaker, but it's obvious to me that they're trying to pretend like they have a Colombian accent, but the Colombian accent is very specific. It's like a native New York accent. It's very hard to recreate authentically. And the cherry on top was that a bird expert found that there was a rare bird that can be heard with its very unique sound, a very unique bark, or not bark, birds don't bark, what's the word? Chirping, I don't know, whatever, bird chirping, in the video, and he could. the bird expert said that's not Colombia. Those birds do not exist in Colombia. Those birds only exist in the western part of Ecuador. So... The guys in, those, in that video were clearly Ecuadorians falsely claiming to be members of the ELN. I mean, just comically incompetent. And in the video, they said, we support comrade Andres Arauz, and we gave him money. I mean, absurd, absurd. But 
that hasn't stopped the Lenny Moreto administration from trying to use this as so-called evidence to try to disqualify Andres Arauz and imprison Andres Arauz by claiming that he was funded by a so-called terrorist group in scare quotes. And the Colombian government has been openly meddling in Ecuadorian democracy. Colombian se Colombia sent its attorney general to Ecuador. He, a few days after the election, he physically traveled to Ecuador to meet with the extremely corrupt attorney general of Ecuador, who was appointed by the corrupt Lenny Moreno administration. And she has been working with him to try to disqualify the leading candidate in the election. And what was the response of the US State Department? We welcome the Ecuadorian government's policies to ensure election transparency, blah, blah, blah. I mean, the, the Biden State Department is absolutely openly supporting this attempt to try to steal the election from the leading socialist candidate, Andres Arauz. Why? Because he represents the Correista movement, which is socialist and anti-imperialist. And because, as I mentioned earlier, under Correa, Ecuador was part of the Bolivarian alliance that I mentioned, the trade alliance with Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Bolivia. And because Ecuador was the headquarters of the Union of South American Nations, UNASUR, which is kind of like an African union for Latin America, which kicked the United States out of Latin American affairs and said that we as independent sovereign countries should be able to determine our own affairs. So what we're seeing is blatant meddling by not only the US government, but by the extremely right-wing and corrupt government in Colombia, blatantly meddling inside Ecuador's election. So that was a long answer, but like all of my answers here, but you know, there's a lot to say and you'll never hear this stuff in mainstream corporate media. So yes, as the former foreign minister of Ecuador, Guillaume Long says, who was foreign minister under Correa, he often says that if Latin American elections are fair and democratic, the pink tide will be back very soon. If they're not democratic, we will see what's going on in Brazil. And the last example of the return potentially of the pink tide is as you mentioned, in Brazil, there was a soft coup once again, backed and overseen by the United States. And by the way, it was started under the Obama administration and continued under Trump. So in Brazil, the Workers' Party came into power, Progressive Party, first under Lula da Silva, the most popular president in Brazil's history, who had over 80% approval when he left office, 80% over when he left office. And then he was followed by the only ever elected female president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff. And Dilma Rousseff was overthrown in a kind of soft coup as part of what they call lawfare, a legal warfare campaign. And this is becoming a more sophisticated imperialist strategy for US meddling in Latin America, where they claim that they're doing it to fight corruption or whatever, but the parliament overthrew her in a parliamentary coup and installed an unelected neoliberal candidate, Michel Temer, who, who proceeded, proceeded to privatize everything and implement all these neoliberal policies. And by the way, while the U.S. is doing this and they claim to be progressive and the Biden administration and Obama administration claim to be representative and anti-racist and feminist, uh, Dilma Rousseff had the most diverse cabinet in Brazilian history and Michel Temer had all light-skinned men were in the cabinet and they were all right-wing neoliberals and bankers and elites. So that says a lot about the Obama administration's priorities because it was the Obama Justice Department that was overseeing this operation called Lava Jato, Operation Lava Jato or Car Wash. And it was a fake anti-corruption investigation that was entirely weaponized by the Brazilian right-wing and oligarchy back to the hilt by the Obama and then Trump Justice Departments to carry out a coup against the Workers' Party. We now know, it is, I mean, when, when, when those of us at the time said this in 2016, we were, we were called conspiracy theorists and whatever. As always, it has been confirmed without any reasonable doubt. In fact, a few weeks ago, the top, one of the top prosecutors in Brazil involved in Lava Jato, the fake anti-corruption investigation, he said when, when Lula was prevented from running for president, he said, we should thank the CIA 
So we now know that the CIA was involved in this operation. We already knew that the FBI was involved because they openly boasted of it on their own website. The Department of Justice was involved. That We now know that every week that the Brazilian prosecutors every week would meet with members of the U.S. Justice Department from both the Obama and Trump Justice Departments to talk about how they can carry out this coup attempt, the successful coup against the Workers' Party government. And finally, in 2018, that led us to the fascist leader, Jair Bolsonaro, who honestly makes Trump look enlightened. I mean, Bolsonaro, I mean, Trump's racism is blatant. Trump's misogyny is blatant. Trump's xenophobia is blatant. Bolsonaro takes it to a whole new level. Bolsonaro, under his party, under his leadership, held an event in the parliament honoring Pinochet, the fascist dictator installed through a CIA coup in 1973 in Chile. Under Bolsonaro, the, he called himself Captain Chainsaw and has been killing indigenous people and encouraging big agribusiness to destroy the Amazon. Bolsonaro has said that if his daughter dated a black woman, he would, if his son dated a black woman, he would disown him. He said that he would disown his son if he were gay. He said when a woman said that, that when a woman, a female parliamentarian criticized him, he told her that she was too ugly to be raped. This is the, the president of Brazil who was installed into power through a coup that was initiated by the Obama administration and continued by the Trump administration. And he, the only reason that Bolsonaro came into power is because the most popular politician in Brazil, Lula, Lula da Silva, was disqualified in 2018 and imprisoned on fake charges of corruption that we, we knew at the time were false, and now we know that they were absolutely false because this week, a judge from Brazil's Supreme Court said that, yes, they were false charges and dropped not only the charges, but he actually nullified all of the sentences, the sentencing that had been done against Lula retroactively. Lula is completely a free man, his political rights have been restored, and he can now legally participate in the election. If he had been allowed to participate in the 2018 election, he would have easily won in a landslide. All of the elections showed Lula leading by double digits. The US government, first under Obama and then under Trump, would rather have a fascist like Bolsonaro than a left-wing anti-imperialist leader like Lula. And they, they helped rig the election and they helped carry out a coup to put Bolsonaro in power. So now the fact that Lula has his rights restored, if he is allowed to participate in the election coming up in 2022, polls show he will win by 13%. He's leading in the polls. But as we saw in the United States, where the Democratic Party leadership would rather sabotage their own party and expose to the world how undemocratic the, their own primary process is in order to destroy Bernie Sanders, as we saw in Iowa, as we saw in New Hampshire, I mean a farce, a total anti-democratic farce, farce. Well, while, while the Democrats were doing that inside the country, we see the U.S. government doing that in Brazil. They would rather have the Trump, the even worse, the Trump on steroids candidate Bolsonaro win than have these these progressive candidate who is even more progressive than Bernie Sanders, Lula da Silva, come back into power. So again, that was a very long answer, like all of my answers here. But I mean, I, I'm glad you asked me about that because I've been able to talk about every country now, Ecuador or every major country. I mean, of course, there are other countries that we could talk about, but Ecuador, Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Nicaragua. Venezuela. The reality is that, once again, as the former, the leftist former foreign minister of Ecuador said, if Latin America is allowed to have free and fair elections without foreign intervention by the United States and without rigging by the local oligarchs, then yes, the progressive forces of the pink tide will be back very soon. And they already are back, as we saw in Bolivia and as we may see in April in Ecuador. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm glad you got to talk about all those countries as well, because uh, people were asking about those countries. And of course, it's important for us to, to, to understand and learn about this. Um, 
speaking of other countries, all right, just real quick, logistically, it's looking like we're going to go over 8.30. So uh, I'll ask Ben uh, another question. It's really two questions, but I'll ask Ben, and then we'll take a couple more questions from the audience, and then we'll get ready to wrap up the program. Uh, also, let me plug in real quick. Uh, somebody was asking about Haiti in the chat. Uh, tomorrow night, we have a program on Haiti. Uh, the whole program is exclusively on Haiti with Daoud Andre. So uh, come check us out. That'll be really good. Um, ben, uh, you mentioned Pinochet. Uh, could you give us an update on uh, uh, what's happening in Chile? And uh, also after that, could you talk a little bit about Peru and the uh, elections coming up in Peru? Yeah, absolutely. The situation in Chile is pretty incredible. And well, actually, I should say really quickly, you mentioned Haiti. And I'm glad you're doing a segment on Haiti tomorrow. The situation is so important there. We, we've also seen, unfortunately, that the Biden administration is totally backing a dictator. I mean, a literal dictator in Haiti who overstayed his term. I mean, his term was already totally undemocratic. But uh, Jovenel Moïse is a complete right-wing dictator, very authoritarian. He has been using death squads and, and very violent police who are shooting protesters in the street, but there's still a massive uprising in Haiti right now. And Daoud Andre is an amazing guest, so I'm glad to hear that you're doing that. And of course, what's going on in Haiti is related to Latin America because in Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, one of the most important things that he did, which revolutionized politics for Latin America, is that he tried to build more relations with the English-speaking countries in the Caribbean, countries like Grenada and Jamaica and also Haiti, which is French-speaking and Creole. But, and under Hugo Chavez, Venezuela created the Petro Caribe program in which just as Venezuela was giving very cheap and free oil to people in the Bronx because poor people in the Bronx in New York were not being able to heat their apartments and they got oil from Venezuela because... Venezuela cares about poor people, the Chavistas care about poor people, and unfortunately, the political class in New York and the United States doesn't. Well, in Venezuela, in Haiti, rather, there was a similar process where, where Hugo Chavez helped give, give oil and money to and loans to Haiti at basically no cost, at very, very low interest, as part of what he said was a debt that the people of Latin America and the world owed to the Haitian people because of the, the great 18, 1791 to 1804 Haitian Revolution, the first successful great anti-slave revolution and, and the first major revolution against colonialism, successful revolution. And so anyway, that, those are the, all these issues are related, of course. Now getting to Chile, it's, it's a pretty incredible situation. In, in 2020, the Chilean people had a referendum and they voted to rewrite the constitution. Let's keep in mind that Chile never had a de-Pinochetization program, meaning that Pinochet came into power on, on, the first, on the first 9-11 attack, if you will, September 11th, 1973. The CIA helped back a coup against, helped orchestrate and back a coup against the democratically elected Marxist president, Salvador Allende. And he, was, he died... He was likely killed. I mean, people say he committed suicide. He was actually likely killed. But regardless, even if he even if he did commit suicide, which I'm skeptical about, he was still killed by the U.S. coup. And Pinochet came into power and had a fascist dictatorship. And he continued into power. And even after he left power, there was never a process of de-Pinochetification. The Constitution created under the Pinochet regime is still the constitution right now in 2021 in Chile. And it's also one of the most neoliberal countries in the world. I mean, it's the birthplace of neoliberalism comes from Chile under Pinochet. And it's an example of how neoliberalism and fascism are not in any way mutually exclusive. We also see that in India right now, which has a fascistic far-right government under Narendra Modi, which is also the most neoliberal government they've ever had, the most pro-so-called free market. He's, he's right now, Modi's trying to push through this farmer's bill that would basically destroy the livelihood of for, poor farmers on behalf of capital, on behalf of big, big ag corporations, and by the way, the Biden administration, the State Department, supports that neoliberal Modi uh, farmers 
law in India. But anyway, the point is that the kind of fascist neoliberal alliance had, has its origins going back into Chile. Although you can actually go back and look at Hitler's economic policies and actually under the Nazis during in, in the 1930s of all the countries in, in Western Europe, the Nazi Germany had the most privatization and the most so-called free market policies of any of those countries in the region. So it's not necessarily new, but you know, the, the Pinochet regime solidified it. And they never were able to, they kind of democratize in Chile, but it's not really real democracy. They have elections, but people don't have economic rights. They don't have, even, even some of the, the very basic programs in the United States that we have, I mean, in the United States, we have very few social programs. Unlike in most countries, in industrialized countries, they have healthcare and education and all these things. In Chile, Water is privatized. Everything is privatized in Chile. It is the most privatized neoliberal country in the world. And the current president is a billionaire oligarch like Trump, Sebastián Piñera, and he also is basically Pinochet light because Piñera, in fact, he gave a speech when there was a process to try to, to extradite Pinochet for the, the crimes against humanity he considered. Uh, so the current president... Back back then, three decades ago, he gave a speech in which Piñera said, we should show our full solidarity with Pinochet against the extradition. And then he later said, well, I don't, I don't support Pinochet, but I mean, he called for full solidarity with Pinochet against the extradition. So he's a Pinochet light leader. And we saw a massive uprising recently in Chile against the neoliberal policies because the government was trying to, to implement even more austerity measures, and there was a huge uprising, and the government of Piñera in Chile responded with massive violence. The, the, for, the police force is known as the Carabineros, Carabineros, who are extremely violent. They would intentionally shoot protesters in the eyes. I know a Chilean journalist, she's a friend of mine, Nicole Caram, she lost eyesight permanently in one of her eyes. She's gone to multiple surgeons, multiple doctors. She cannot ever get her eyesight back in one of those eyes. She is one of hundreds of protesters. I mean, she wasn't even a protester. She was a journalist. She is one of hundreds of Chileans who have permanently had their eyesight damaged because of the Chilean forces brutally cracking down violently on anti-neoliberal protests. And by the way, during that very violent crackdown, Piñera himself gave a speech in which he, he quoted basically Pinochet and said, we are at war, which, and he's talking about being at war against his own people. He's saying that they're not protests, that they're a war. He also blamed the protests on Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba, the, the, as the Trump administration called it, the so-called Troika of tyranny, and and it's not a coincidence that those are the only three countries with social, were the only so, countries with socialist governments remaining in the region until Bolivia came back. And by the way, the Secretary General, the coup plotting Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Luis Almagro, he also formally accused Cuba and Venezuela of being behind the progressive protests in Chile. I mean, just showing how much of a farce, how much of a fraud the OAS Secretary General is. So the situation there is very bad, but there's an election coming up, and oh man, you can bet that, that Washington, that the U.S. government is terrified right now, shaking in their boots, because the most recent poll shows that who is leading, who is the leading candidate for the upcoming presidential election in Chile? Drum roll, it is the candidate from the Communist Party of Chile. So goes to show that as much as the U.S. can try to destroy the left in Chile and overthrow democracy, all the, the, the leading polls show that the top candidate leading in the presidential election in Chile right now, and who's going to win if it's free and fair, is the candidate from the Communist Party. He's also, by the way, a Palestinian and he strongly supports Palestine, and he has a very anti-imperialist foreign policy.
the Chilean Communist Party is not a revolutionary communist party. They're like the Communist Party of Italy during World War II, or sorry, after World War II during the Cold War. The Italian Communist Party, they actually governed much of Italy, including Bologna, for decades. The Chilean Communist Party is very similar. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of like, you know, they're a socialist party with an anti-imperialist foreign policy, but they're leading in the polls. And then as for Peru, I mean, I don't want to be very pessimistic, but the reality is that the progressive forces in Peru have been really defeated. And you have to, to understand why you have to go back to the horrors of the war under the, I mean, just like the, the fascistic regime of Fujimori there. He, he was another kind of fascistic neoliberal leader, kind of like a Bolsonaro before Bolsonaro in Peru. And he helped carry out an extermination campaign against the left, partially because of this, this group Shining Path, the Communist Party of Peru, which was a very ex like ultra left. I mean, they took things very hard. They, they also like waged a war against the left and they killed a lot of leftists. I mean, it, it was a horror show in Peru. And unfortunately, the left-wing forces there are very weak. And there, there actually, there were two, <laughs> in Peru recently, there were massive protests going on and there were two presidents who resigned in the span of a week. I mean, just massive political instability, huge protests going on. But the reality is that the left-wing forces are very weak and most of the candidates are pretty neoliberal there. So I don't want to be pessimistic, but Peru has its own history of, you know, just an eradication of the left, which is kind of similar to Colombia. The violence against the left in Peru and the violence against the left in Colombia has been so extreme. And we're talking about thousands of people, not just persecuted, but literally killed. So we have to understand that in a lot of these countries, especially Colombia, when we're talking about the repression of the left, it's not just the kind of policies I'm talking about, like in Brazil, where it's a legal coup and, and lawfare, not just in Ecuador, where it's also kind of lawfare and political persecution. We're talking about mass extermination. And in, in, in Colombia in the 1980s, there was a kind of political genocide against the left against this party called the Patriotic Union, the Uni La Unión Patri Patriotica, and thousands of people on the left have been exterminated. So I have a lot of respect for people on the left in Colombia and Peru and some of the, and Chile, because in those countries, they have, they have suffered so much persecution that we can't even imagine it. Yeah, right. Okay, next up, uh, let's take a question from uh, Michael. Michael Hoey had a question. Hey, ben, I recently read a book by Vincent Bevins, The Jakarta Method, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade and the Mass Murder Program that Shaped Our World. And he started with uh, Indonesia, but he mentions a lot of these countries that, that you're talking about. And I guess he was a reporter in both Chile and Brazil. And one of the things he points out is that there are um, organizations, or at least there were in the 60s and 70s, anti-communist organizations that would share ideas on how to kill or destroy the left around the world. And I'm wondering how these private individuals that have the resources that are dedicated to wiping out communist, socialist, or what they consider fellow travelers. Do you have any idea what they're doing today or if they're still as gung-ho, so to speak, as they were in the 60s and 70s? Yeah, well, the, the Jakarta Method documents what a lot of people on the left were saying, especially in the Global South throughout the Cold War, that it, was, it had nothing, the Cold War had nothing to do with democracy. It was about socialism versus capitalism. And and that's, not, that's not to say that all of the socialist governments were like perfect utopias. They had problems, but the U.S. had no problem supporting the most vicious fascist dictatorships. And, and I think in order to understand what you're talking about, you have to go back and understand that really when fascism was defeated, it wasn't the United States that defeated fascism. It was the Soviet Union. 26 million Soviets died in World War II. 400,000 Americans and Brits died. I mean... Not to downplay how that's horrible, I mean, it's a lot of people, but it's nothing compared to 26 million. 
That's not to consider, by the way, 10 to 20 million Chinese who were killed leading the fight against Japanese fascism. So the over, over three quarters, really over 80% of, of Nazis killed and wounded and captured in World War II were killed and wounded and captured by the Red Army and its allies. And almost all of the significant fighting until 1943 was on the Eastern Front. So the reality is that fascism was defeated for the most part by the Soviet Union. And that, that's also one of the reasons why after World War II, so much of Eastern and, and Central Europe became communist. And that's why in Italy and France, the communist parties were so massive and so popular. They were the most popular parties, which is why the CIA helped rig the 1948 election against the French Communist Party. And it's why the, against the, sorry, the Italian Communist Party, the first post-war election in Italy was rigged by the CIA and the first major CIA operation in 1948. And then the French Communist Party, there was also a lot of meddling to prevent them from coming into power legally through democratically rather. So the reality is that I, I, I talk about that history because we have to understand that what happened is that after World War II, the US, which created NATO, it basically absorbed fascism. It didn't really defeat it, it absorbed it. So we now know that nearly three quarters of the members of the Justice Department in capitalist West Germany were former Nazis. They were former members of the Nazi party up until the 1970s that West Germany's intelligence services, which are still the intelligence services to this day, were created by a former Nazi, Gellin, R Richard Gellin, Reinhard Gellin, who was a CIA asset. And the CIA worked with this former Nazi to create West German intelligence and then now German, Germany's intelligence services. We know that NATO, through Operation Gladio, NATO, NATO supported former Nazis and Italian fascists and other fascist collaborators and repurposed them for what they called stay behind programs in case there was ever a hot war with the Soviet Union. We, so the point, and then we know through Operation Paperclip, and I would recommend reading the book Operation Paperclip, it shows how the United States took hundreds of former, thousands of former Nazi scientists over to the United States and they helped run U.S. programs like NASA, which was created by former Nazi scientists who experimented on human, human experiments. They did experiments on, on Jews, on Romani people. They did human experiments on people. And then the United, the United States government brought them over to be NASA scientists. So we have to understand that history, that the Cold War had nothing to do with democracy. If it had something to do with democracy, then why was one of the founding members of NATO a fascist dictatorship? The Portuguese... Estado Novo fascist dictatorship was part of a founding member of NATO. And they supported Pinochet. They supported Suharto and his fascist regime in Indonesia, which carried out one of the worst genocides in, in the 20th century. It's not just my take. The CIA itself said, and that we now declassify documents, the CIA, which supported the fascist coup against a socialist in in Indonesia, Sukarno, and installed the fascist Suharto, the CIA admitted that Suharto, with CIA backing, oversaw one of the worst massacres in all of the 20th century, on par with the Nazi Holocaust. And that was in Indonesia. And I should mention that before, by the way, before that book came out, the Jakarta Method, there, was, there were really good movies that were made. Um, something, the, something The Silence, something Silence, uh, that that's about the genocide backed by the U.S. in Indonesia and just how horrible it was. Anyway, so to get back to your main question, I mean, we should understand that those aren't just private institutions. Those are organizations. Those were campaigns that were deeply linked to U.S. intelligence, to the CIA specifically, one of the most blood-soaked organizations in human history, and linked to U.S. corporations and European, Western European corporations that had been funding these operations and organized crime networks, which, I mean, anyone who knows the history of the labor movement in the United States knows that there's a long history of corporations funding organized crime networks, mafia groups to, to kill and threaten and break the backs of unions, to kill labor organizers, to break strikes. And that's what they do locally in New York and that's what they did in Appalachia to try to break the back of the miners union. And internationally, they do, they do the same thing with communists and socialists. 
is they use organized crime networks to destroy and destabilize existing socialist governments. I mean, that's the great game. It, it, it has nothing to do with democracy. It's, it's hard geopolitics. And we, we saw it in so many examples as William Blum, uh, rest his soul, as William Blum documented in his book. I mean, it, it's, there, there were dozens and dozens of these kinds of operations. And Latin America, of course, saw the majority of them because Latin America is so close to the United States. And because since the 1820s, the United States has declared Latin America to be its colonial backyard as part of the Monroe Doctrine. And I should mention, by the way, that under the Donald Trump administration, multiple Trump administration officials invoked the 200-year-old colonial Monroe Doctrine, including Mike Pompeo and John Bolton, former National Security Advisor. So when, they, when the U.S. government sees Latin America, they see it, and they sometimes even use this language, as their colonial backyard. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so we'll take one, maybe two more questions, and then we'll uh, close off the program. So uh, we have a question from Yoav, an activist in Western Mass and a uh, valued member of Mass Peace Action. Yoav asks, uh, can, Ben, can you talk about the conflict of using natural resources like oil and gas by Latin American uh, revolutionary governments and the protection of indigenous land and reducing carbon emission and how this conflict is used uh, by the empire and right-wing forces to discredit the revolutionary governments. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't know if you're having some sound issues, but I think it's better now. But Were you, uh, did you catch the question? What was I breaking Yeah, yeah, up? yeah, I, yeah, I got it. Okay. Uh, by the way, I just wanna, yeah, someone pointed out that the act of killing is that that film I mentioned, by the way, about the Indonesian genocide. And I was thinking of, I, I knew it was something silence. The look of silence is the companion. The act of killing was first, and then the look of silence is the sequel. Incredible films, I would, I would highly recommend them just to understand the human toll of these, of US foreign policy and how the people in Washington making these decisions in air conditioned offices and suits, they don't understand, I mean, it, the extreme suffering we're talking about because they just, they don't see it. They, they're making the decisions, you know, it's so, it's so disjointed for them. So to get back to your question, this is a really good question. It's a, it's a difficult issue. It's a, it's a contradictory issue and there's a lot of things that need unpacking. And I, I've been answering all these questions so long and I, I know there's other questions. So from now on, I'm going to try to keep, to try to keep my answers a little shorter here to answer people's questions. But on this issue of environmentalism. First of all, I, we need to preface by saying that the responsibility for, the bulk of the responsibility for fighting climate change is on the back of the imperialist governments in the global north who are already developed and who develop themselves through fossil fuel extraction, through imperialism and through slavery. So the US is by far still the world's largest emitter of fossil fuels. China follows, although China has the four large, uh, sorry, China has the world's largest population and its population is four times larger than the United States. So when we look at fossil fuel emissions, we have to look at per capita, not just net. And China, by the way, although it certainly has a long way to go, it consumes a lot of coal and, it, you know, but China has actually, unlike the United States, been reducing its carbon footprint and trying to take a lot of measures to move toward renewable energy and to to stop you know as much uh, carbon emissions although certainly china admits a lot india is in also growing in number but the reality is that the us and western europe these countries which colonized china which colonized india which colonized latin america and africa and other parts of asia they have the responsibility to deal with the, the bulk of reducing carbon emissions because they have benefited from it so much and it's not fair at all. And there have been programs proposed by the way, including at the United Nations by Evo Morales and by other progressive leaders in the global South for climate reparations and for reparations for colonialism. And specifically Evo Morales was working and trying to reduce fossil fuel expenditure and extractions in Latin America as part of a program if global North imperialist countries agreed to reparations. Of course, they didn't agree to reparations. Uh, 
But I think that would be a great program to help collectively deal with climate change. But the reality is that Venezuela and Ecuador and Brazil, I mean, Brazil is a huge country, but still these countries are, are responsible for still a small percentage of global carbon emissions. And they have a right to be able to develop their countries. These are still very poor countries with massive problems with infrastructure lacking and problems with healthcare and education. They have the right to be able to develop their countries and yes, to be able to use their own natural resources to benefit their, their poor and working people. Unlike in the United States where the, all of those natural resources are privately owned and they go to corporations like ExxonMobil. So yeah, it's a complex issue, but the reality is also that these progressive governments in Latin America that are called extractivist, especially Ecuador and Venezuela, have also pursued ambitious environmental programs. They, they support environmental action internationally, but you can't tell a poor country where they still don't, there are still large numbers of people who don't even have paved roads, who don't have electricity, who don't have water and sewage. You can't tell them that they're not allowed to use their natural resources to benefit poor and working people unless you're gonna actually provide support and reparations. That's my take. And it's so, it's so crazy because we saw this narrative weaponized against Evo Morales, the first and only ever indigenous president of Bolivia, a man who re helped rewrite a constitution in a constitutional referendum in 2009 in Bolivia that was the first country to enshrine the rights of mother nature into the constitution. But we saw this same narrative weaponized against Evo Morales, accusing him and the, the progressive socialist government in Bolivia of being responsible for the fires in the Amazon that were actually mostly caused by Captain Chainsaw Bolsonaro in Brazil. But unfortunately, that propaganda campaign worked. And there were a lot of environmentalists, including in the United States, who I think they were well-intentioned but didn't understand how they were being manipulated in the lead up to the coup. What, this is a guy who is indigenous, who's an environmentalist, who enshrined the rights of mother nature into his constitution. And who, by the way, Evo Morales did the most to fight the rainforest, the Amazon rainforest fires. He, he paid millions of dollars for a massive plane that he filled with water to put out the fires. So we have to understand that you have to be able to, if you're a poor country in the global South, which by the way, is facing the consequences of climate change already and wants to fight climate change, you have to be able to balance that at the same time with development because you are still a very poor country and, and environmentalists in the global North, many of them don't understand the poverty that we're talking about because it's extreme poverty that doesn't exist in industrialized countries. So these countries in the global South, like Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, they have to be able to balance their development with environmental policies. And until rich imperialist countries are offering reparations and not just reparations for imperialism and colonialism, but also climate change, they're going to, these global South countries are going to have to resort to, at least to an extent to extraction. Right. Um, okay, so, you know, listening to your report on uh, Chile, for example, and also you said that if, if these countries in uh, Latin and South America, if they were to have free and fair elections, a lot of them would elect, uh, you know, more uh, candidates that are more for the people and less for the imperial program. Um, I, I, I guess the last question here of the night is, uh, let me figure out how to say this, like, uh, is within within these countries and also within the US, what, if anything, gives you hope for a better future for uh for, for these countries? Or is it is it more cynical that even like the, the, the imperial powers are too strong and um kind of related to that? And I know that this might not be exactly your area of expertise, but I'd just like your opinion. What advice or opinion would you give to us here at Mass Peace Action or peace activists in general about what we can do to help uh, 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 help our, our own government be less imperial towards these countries? Absolutely. Great question. And it's a great note to end on.
really quickly, I'm going to answer two brief questions also in the chat, just because, you know, I was ranting a lot and people didn't, unfortunately, I know they didn't get a chance to ask a lot of questions. I'll answer these very briefly and then I'll answer your question. Someone asked about vac vaccination in Latin America. What's incredible is that I would highly recommend, it hasn't been reported much in English, but Pfizer was acting like conquistadors in Latin America. It's incredible what they were demanding for vaccination, uh, to, to provide vaccines, specifically to Argentina. The Argentine government was very angry and revealed that Pfizer was demanding control, access to Argentina's water and fish. They wanted Argentina to privatize its water and fish and to pay Pfizer with those resources in return for vaccines. So the response of Argentina was, screw that. And Argentina went to Russia and Russia has been, has been selling the Sputnik V vaccine for very cheap. I mean, it's giving them to some countries. Russia gave some Sputnik vaccines here to Nicaragua and has been, you know, using it as a kind of kind of diplomacy and people are calling it vaccine diplomacy. So, I mean, the U.S. actually has not been providing many vaccines to Latin America. Most countries here in Latin America, like most countries in the world, because they're trying to vaccinate as quickly as possible, they're re resorting to a variety. So they're using a mix. Argentina has most of its vaccines from Russia, but they have a mix of other countries. Here in Nicaragua, a lot of it's from Russia, but they also have part of the Indian vaccine. And a lot of other countries are getting the vaccine from China. So there's a big mix. And ironically, there's not much of the US vaccine because, because Pfizer was demanding control of countries' natural resources in return for giving them the vaccine. I mean, incredible kind of colonial behavior. Another quick question I'll answer is about Sitgo, about if buying Sitgo gas helps Venezuela. No. Unfortunately, the reality is that Sitco was stolen by the United States at the beginning of the coup attempt with Juan Guaido in February 2019. Now, Sitco, to explain really quickly here, Sitco is the oil refinery arm of Venezuela in the United States. Based, it was in Texas. And the United States, at the beginning of the coup attempt with Juan Guaido, when, when Washington and its allies recognized Juan Guaido, as the unelected fake president of Venezuela, despite him never winning a vote in a presidential election ever. And when they did that, the US also and European countries seized Venezuelan property in blatant theft. I mean, there's nothing diplomatic about it. The Bank of England stole over a billion dollars worth of Venezuelan gold, of physical gold. They just stole the gold because Venezuela had held, held that gold in the Bank of England. The U.S. also stole Venezuelan assets. Other European countries, including Portugal, has stolen over a billion dollars of Venezuelan assets. I mean, massive theft. Japan as well. And in the United States, they seized Sitgo and then handed that to Juan Guaido's extremely corrupt gang. And by the way, the Juan Guaido gang, as my colleague Anya Parmpel has reported, they've been basically helping U.S energy corporations like ExxonMobil and Chevron try to try to privatize Sitco. Basically what they were doing is that there were a bunch of cases against, uh, against Sitco because Hugo Chavez, when he was Venezuelan president, he kicked out all of the US and other foreign oil corporations and he nationalized the oil and made it controlled by the state oil company PDVSA. So there were a lot of companies including US and Canadian companies, including a Canadian mining company that were, they had, they had legal cases against Venezuela. And when Juan Guaido was recognized as fake president, the US allowed those companies to sue the government of Venezuela, which is run by supposedly by Juan Guaido in scare quotes. So those corporations sued Juan Guaido's fake government for billions of dollars in damages that were taken by Chavez and we reported the grays on my Anya colleague, Anya, Anya, my colleague Anya Parmpo exposed that Juan Guaido's own advisors and so-called staff were helping those corporations in their cases against Venezuelan state assets. So they were basically helping cannibalize the fictitious government that they run because the U.S. seized all Venezuela's U.S.-based assets and gave them to, to Juan Guaido, including Sitco.
So, I mean, we're talking about these people are such traitors. Not, not only is Juan Guaido and, and his coup gang working with the U.S. government to try to orchestrate a coup, to try to launch a military invasion, which is what they tried in, in, the, in the so-called Bay of Piglets or Operation Gideon in 2020, when they, they unsuccessfully invaded the country and tried to kill Maduro. But they're also actively selling out their own country. They're literally se- trying to sell their own government assets and then, of course, pocket the money. And we know that Carlos Vecchio, who is the fake U.S. ambassador from Juan Guaido's fake coup regime, he himself, who, by the way, was a lawyer for ExxonMobil before he became, he worked with ExxonMobil and Chevron and these U.S. oil corporations He's now also once again working on their behalf by trying to help privatize Citgo. I mean, it's it's so so cynical. And in Spanish, there's an insult people use on the left. Usually, they'll call right wingers "vende patrias," which means it literally translates to selling your homeland. And they are textbook examples. Juan Guaido and his gang they are selling their country out literally, and enriching themselves in the process. So finally, to answer your question, and this is a great question to end on, I'm actually very hopeful. I think that, and that's one of the reasons that I spend a lot of time reporting in Latin America. I mean, clearly, I, I make my political views open. I'm, I don't believe in the idea of neutral journalism, as if Judy Miller at the New York Times was, was a neutral journalist when she sold lies, or as if all the other lies who sold the Gulf of Tonkin incident or countless other examples of lies as if they're neutral. No, they're not neutral. They're propagandists for the US government and the US national security state and the Pentagon and the military industrial complex. I'm an anti-imperialist journalist. I'm an anti-war journalist. And what I report are objective facts. You can fact check me in every fact I said today, and it's true, objectively true, but I also have my own view. I'm a progressive, I'm a socialist, I'm anti-war. and. One of the reasons that I am reporting in Latin America and spend so much time here and live here and have immersed myself in it is because I actually believe that there's a lot of potential here. And as someone who's progressive, I think that Latin America is a model for the world, for the left, for progressive movements, showing that you can be a socialist and win elections in a landslide, as we saw in Bolivia, as we see in many countries, and that you can be progressive and a feminist and support indigenous rights and anti-racist and all these things and combine that program with a robust economic progressive program. Whereas the Democrats, unfortunately, are becoming more and more right-wing economically where they're, well, they're using identity in a very neoliberal way and removing the class element. In Latin America, they show you how you can do both and you should do both. You must do both. So despite all of the difficulties, no, I think that as Guillaume Long, the former Ecuadorian former minister said, that if the elections are free and fair in Latin America, if, if Latin American people, peoples in Latin America are allowed to have democracy, the left is winning and will continue to win. So that's why for me, anti-imperialism is so important because anti-imperialism is at the heart of the struggle for people on the left, for progressive people, because it's empire that exists to protect the oligarchy. That's, they're not, it's that simple. Why, why does the military industrial complex exist? Why does the US wage war around the world? Why does the US carry out these unpopular policies? The war in Iraq was not popular. The war in Afghanistan is not popular right now. It's 20 years old. The war in Yemen is not popular. The war in Syria is not popular. These, these are not popular policies because they're not done on behalf of the American people. They're done on behalf of the capitalist oligarchy of Jeff Bezos, of Elon Musk, Elon Musk, by the way, after the coup in Bolivia, he said on Twitter openly, we will coup whoever we want. He's referring to the fact that Bolivia has the world's largest lithium reserves. And lithium is going to be, it's it's already very important for renewable energy, for computers and cameras and phones. And by the way, as we move toward renewable energy, lithium is now going to be what they call white gold. It's, there's a new gold rush for lithium because it's going to fuel the new green movement toward renewable energy. And Elon Musk said it openly. We will coup whoever we want and we will steal your lithium. So 
the reality is that if we want that renewable energy, if we want that green transition, it's going to have to be through these anti-imperialist movements and through these progressive movements in Latin America. There's, there's so much they represent. And these policies, the coup in Honduras, the coup in Brazil, the coup in Paraguay in 2012, I didn't even mention, the, the coup in Bolivia in 2019, the coup in Chile in 73, the coup in Guatemala in 54, the coup in Iran in 53, these are not policies on behalf of the American people. They're on behalf of U.S. corporations and the U.S. oligarchy, the capitalist elites who dominate U.S. politics. And the more that people in Latin America can free themselves from the U.S. empire, the weaker the U.S. empire becomes, the more that the U.S. can actually benefit, use money, use tax dollars to benefit its people, to benefit poor and working people at home instead of spending all of its budget waging war abroad with over a $700 billion military budget. And that's just on the books. That's not considering the trillions of dollars, the literally trillions of dollars that the Pentagon can't account for because it can't actually account, it can't actually do, uh, do accounting with its own budget. So the reality is that, as Michael Parenti says, the, the brilliant historian and, and scholar says, the empire feeds on the republic. And I always stress this point, why should we care, even aside from the fact that we should care because these are our comrades in the global south struggling, especially in Latin America, struggling. We should care, not only should we care because it's our government, because they're doing it in our name, even though they're not acting on our behalf, they're acting on behalf of the oligarchy. We should care because we should care about people suffering and wanna help oppressed and poor people around the world. But most important of all, we should care because the US empire feeds on the Republic. It was just as true for the Roman empire as it is for the US empire. There is no democracy in the United States because the US system is set up to protect the empire, which protects the elites. After World War II, the system was set up to protect capitalism. The United States was the protector of capitalism and the, the US corporations are the beneficiaries of that system. Jeff Bezos, the first ever 200 billionaire in human history is the beneficiary of that system. So the weaker that the US empire gets, the weaker that the US war machine gets, the stronger that popular movements at home can get. It's part of the same struggle. And I just wanna thank you for inviting me and letting me rant and talk about these things because of course, you know, mainstream corporate media never will. And just end on that note and thank you all and keep up the work that you're doing because it's, it's the most important part of this struggle around the world is this, the, the fight against empire is the fight for progress, is the fight for poor people, for oppressed people. It's the, all these issues are inextricably linked and in the heart of the United States, it, it couldn't be any more important. Yeah, no, Ben, thank you so much for joining us and for uh, being so generous with your time. We really love hearing from you. I'm sure you're seeing all the comments in the chat. Everyone really loved hearing from you about uh, everything. You reported so much. It's going to, I'll have to go back and rewatch this video like a few times just to soak in all the information you you dropped on us. So uh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate your time so much and your interest in these issues. Um, Brian is going to share again in the chat a link you can click to send a message uh, to members of Congress and uh, to let them know uh, basically to you know uh, be a better neighbor to our to our uh, neighbors in uh, Central America and South America and Latin America and throughout the Caribbean. Um, so so please do send that message to Congress. Um, again, this program is sponsored by Mass Peace Action. Our organization is uh, really uh, uh, built by and moves by uh, volunteers. And uh, our volunteers, we get together in working groups to discuss Latin America or the Middle East or uh, new Cold War with China. Uh, we organize rallies and standouts uh, at historical monuments and outside congressional offices. Uh, we host educational events like the one we do tonight. So uh, if anybody on the call or watching on YouTube or anywhere is interested in uh, getting more involved with Mass Peace Action, uh, you can send me an email. Everyone on this call will have my email uh, by tomorrow. I'll email out a recording of this video to everyone. 
So please do share that video around. Reach out to me at any time. Uh, you can also email info at masspeaceaction.org. Um, so again, everyone, thank you so much. Ben, before we sign off, can you uh, let people know if they're more interested in finding your work, uh, where can they find you? And actually, even before you answer that, just again, thank you not only just to you, but also to the gray zone, the entire gray zone. Your The work you guys do really helps uh, inform us and, uh, with the work we do here. So Ben, where can people find your work? Thank you so much. It means a lot. You can check out our work at thegrayzone.com and that's gray with an A, the, the Yankee spelling. And you can find me on Twitter at Benjamin Norton. And I, Max, my colleague Max Blumenthal and I have a podcast actually called Moderate Rebels. And, you know, we talk about this stuff and we have fun and we keep it casual and make jokes. So you can check out Moderate Rebels. And thank you to everyone. I mean, anytime I'm always, I always love speaking for peace groups and anti-war groups because it's so important. It's so, so important. So thank you to everyone for the work you do. Right. Well, thanks again, Ben. And thank you again to everyone else, uh, everyone here for joining us tonight. And on that note, I will say have a great night.